on behalf of the Department of Sociology, Psychology and Social Work of the University of the West Indies Western Jamaica Campus, in partnership with the Child and Adolescent Mental Health Unit of the Ministry of Health and Wellness and the Western Regional Mental Health Unit, I want to take this opportunity to welcome you to this year's staging of our third annual public connecting lecture series entitled Holding Our Parents During a Global Pandemic. The University of the West Indies and its partners recognizes the value of investment in supporting our nation's parents. Parenting is never an easy feat, and the demands of the COVID-19 pandemic has increased its challenges. How do we parent, work, teach while taking care of ourselves? For some parents, the act of parenting was never a lived experience. And so this evening and over the next two evenings, we invite you to join us with your family, friends and colleagues as our esteemed local guests and panelists engage us in conversations on holding our parents. Please share, like, subscribe and comment as you join us on this worthwhile experience. I will be inviting Dr. Patrick Prendergast, the director of the University of the West Indies Western Jamaica campus, and Dr. Judith Leibel, Director of Child and Adolescent Mental Health Services, to join us in a few moments to bring greetings. This evening, our moderator will be the esteemed Dr. Lisa Beth Crossman, who will be introducing our guest presenter and keynote speaker, Dr. Abigail Harrison. I thank you. Dr. Prendergast? Thank you very much, Georgia. Good evening, everyone. You know, this morning I made a post on my FB page expressing how proud I am of the psychology unit here at the UEMONA Western Jamaica campus for hosting this, the third staging of the WJC Parenting Series. I also extended gratitude to the partners and partnerships developed over the last several years, both at the individual and at the institutional levels. We simply could not have done it without you. I want to thank particularly Ms. Georgia Rose, who is the lecturer coordinator for the De Department of Psychology, Sociology and Social Work at the UIMONA WJC for her vision and certainly her leadership. Of course, we must acknowledge and recognize the strong support of her colleagues in the department and the institutional support of, for example, the Western Regional Health Authority and individuals like Dr. Elizabeth Crossman. Thank you all. It is you as partners that really and truly make the WJC's mission of quality experience for the entire community real. This lecture se seminar series was conceptualized out of the acknowledgement that parents do benefit from parenting support. And in times such as these, where everybody is experiencing new and different relationships with their children, with their partners, with their colleagues at home, at work, and at play, it is even more critical that we reach out and support each other. As Georgia reminds me, this series comes from the understanding that for some parents, proper parenting was never ever lived experience. And as such, some parents struggle in their journey of parenting. I always say that parenting is one of those responsibilities in life for which there is no preschooling, so to speak. Parents need as much support and guidance in developing the special skills and competencies that make for success in building good, healthy relationships. So the goal of the lecture series has always been to encourage and to support parents through facts, sharing of facts and the sharing of other parenting stories. And so I want to thank the special team of presenters and lecturers who have volunteered their expertise, not just to this endeavor, but certainly to all the others that have taken place over the last three years. This evening, we want to especially welcome Dr. Judith Leiber and Dr. Abigail Harrison. And I do hope that everyone who is engaged as parents, as children, as content experts, all of us, will benefit from this exercise. Given the global pandemic and the changing demands on parents around the world, it is extremely critical, it is timely, and it is relevant to hold our parents at this time. Hold their hands, provide physical support, offer mental affirmation. So in commending the team on hosting this series, 
and extending welcome to all those who are engaged with us, I will close with this little verse. Now is the time to give gladly, reach out and hug a parent today. Open up, ask for and accept help. Learn to love, learn to live, learn to care, dare to learn, to give, to be there. Hold each other now. And on behalf of the UE Mona Western Jamaica campus and all our colleagues and partners and friends, I say to you, have an enlightening evening. Thank you. Good evening. Dr. Judith Leibo, the Director of Child and Adolescent Mental Health Services in the Ministry of Health and Wellness, will now give us greetings. Good evening, everyone. And I'd like to thank <coughs> the Mental Health Unit of the Western Regional Health Authority for inviting me to bring greetings at this parenting seminar. I'd like to congratulate them for having done this. And this is the third in a row, in a row. And also congratulate the um, Western Campus of the Department of Social Work, Sociology and Psychology for, for their input as well. The Child and Adolescent Unit Child and Adolescent Mental Health Unit at the um, Ministry of Health and Wellness recognizes how important parenting is. And as Dr. Prendiga said, it's something that you never ever feel that you are like 100%. <laughs> you always feel that you can learn more, and some parents I know, they, um, after the children are grown, they will even say to themselves, um, they start having regrets, did I do it right? What did I do wrong? So this seminar is really to really help us to be one step closer to doing the best that we can for our children. As I said, parenting is an awesome task. It's really the most, difficult task in the world, but it can also be the most satisfying task. When I think of what the Ministry of Health has done over the years, I remember the national family planning, um, the adage, their mantra, two is better than too many, because we have always said that parenting begins with planning your family. And we've had other parenting things, but um, not really on a wide scale. We did um, some work with emotional intelligence, trying to get parents to learn emotional intelligence. Um, that was a few years ago. So I really am um, <clears throat> happy to bring greetings. I'm happy to be involved. And I want to congratulate Ms. Rose and Dr. Crossman and the rest of the team um, for the work and the energy that they show in putting on the parenting seminar. And I would like to wish them all the very best and to, to pledge that the Child and Adolescent Mental Health Unit of the Ministry of Health and Wellness will always be supportive of them. Thank you. Libel. And can I continue to extend thanks to Dr. Patrick Prendergast, who spoke before her, and he really spoke on how we can hold our parents during the global pandemic, and how we can learn to live, learn to care, and Dr. Libel reminding us of the awesome experience that we will have as parents, and how we can look at the interventions that are geared towards helping our parents in raising our children in this era. Ladies and gentlemen, as we continue, we would like to welcome our very special presenter for this evening.
Dr. Abigail Harrison is a lecturer, consultant, pediatrician, and adolescent medicine subspecialist in the Department of Child and Adolescent Health at the University of the West Indies and the University Hospital of the West Indies. She received her undergraduate medical and postgraduate training in pediatrics at the University of the West Indies Mona, and then went on to complete a clinical fellowship in adolescent medicine at the hospital for sick children at University of Toronto. Dr. Harrison's research interests include delivery of healthcare services to adolescents, adolescent resilience, and disordered eating behaviors in adolescents. Her goal is the continued improvement of adolescent healthcare in Jamaica and the Caribbean to be achieved through national, regional, and international collaborative efforts. She's happily married with an adolescent daughter to keep her busy and entertained. Who best, ladies and gentlemen, to really engage us in speaking on holding our parents during a global pandemic? Dr. Harrison, we welcome you at this time to speak to us. Thank you, Dr. Crossman. It's my pleasure to be here. Um, thank you to the organizers for having me and good evening to our parents. You are really the guests of honor tonight. I'm just here as a guide to hopefully make a difference in some small way in how you proceed with your young people from zero all the way up to 1920, I guess. What I would say um, is that I am a little biased because the adolescents really are my passion. Um, but as a mom coming up the tracks, um, you know, you have your different challenges at each time. So give me a second. Let me just bring up my screen. It is a little bit different to not have you here in person and not be able to, you know, really connect and say everything that I want to say and feel how you are feeling, but we're going to press along nonetheless. So this evening, <clears throat> I've opted kind of to talk a little bit about just balancing parental roles. And I don't want this to be a really heavy talk, but I want to expose some thoughts that I have, probably some challenges you are facing, and hopefully we can make some progress in terms of how we um, manage all the different things that we're juggling at any one time. So as an outline, I'm going to look at some new and some old parental roles. Um, we're going to look at nurturing, guiding, you know, your occupational roles, and now this new role as a surrogate teacher. Talk a little bit about understanding your adolescent, building some resilience, and then some parental self-care. I think that's the one that we're not so good at sometimes. So nurturing, really, this is what we are supposed to be doing all the time. You know, this involves providing basic needs, food, shelter, clothes, carrying them to the doctor, to the health center, to make sure to get their immunizations, you know, making sure to get up, put on a uniform, go to school, whether it be virtual or not. Um, and then other needs, you know, this is the softer skills, giving them love, showing them attention, showing them that you understand them or at least trying to understand them, accepting them, spending time with them and supporting them. And I'm gonna challenge all of us to just give a little thought, which one are we better at? And where do we generally tend to put most of our focus? Um, I won't answer for everybody, but I suspect many, um, you know, sometimes we say, well, we have to sort out the basic needs and sometimes we feel like, oh my goodness, do we have time for the rest? Now, why is it important to be nurturing? So some of the outcomes that we'll see is that our young people will have better self-esteem. They learn to feel good about themselves because we have told them that they should feel good about themselves. They're worthy of feeling good about themselves. They not only feel loved, but they know that they are loved and that they're worthy of being loved. That is so important to conceive of being worthy of being loved. They feel like their opinion counts when we actually stop and listen to them and that they're understood. And that's a big deal, especially as they become adolescents. They learn to trust because you have been a trustworthy parent. They learn to face challenges because they know if the road gets a little rocky, you're gonna be there to kind of back them and hold them. And then they learn how to support others, their peers, 
um, their colleagues emotionally because you have been their role model in showing them how to be emotionally supportive. Now, while we're being nurturing, we have to make sure we find that balance. So we can't be the overprotective parent that wants to always be there and the door can never be locked and they can go outside and talk to their friend and you have to check their phone every day to see who they're talking to. You have to, you know, find that balance. So you can't be overprotective. You can't be the absentee parent who just said, well, whatever. I can't bother take on that argument tonight. Met them sort out themselves. So we can't lean to one side or the other, we have to find that balance, right? And it's such a delicate balance. I always say this is probably our most important role with life, in life, but we have no manual, no standard operating procedure, no like a booklet that says, okay, this is step one, two, three, four. If you do this, you're good. That's, we don't have that for parenting. Maybe one day we will, <laughs> I doubt it though. Now our other role is creating structure, right? So. This is the hard part. This is where we have to give guidance, but not control. This is where we have to teach and impart our values. And they're not going to absorb all our values as they get older. They're going to keep some, hopefully most. And some they're going to be like, yeah, no, I'm not holding on to that. Forget it, mommy. This is where we set rules. We set boundaries. That must be age appropriate. So yes, your 10 year old cannot stay out until 1 a.m. But your 18 year old, why not, right? Unless they've given you a reason not to trust them, you should trust them. And even when they, you know, they mess up and they do something a little silly, that is the purpose of adolescence to make errors and to figure out how you're gonna overcome those um, errors, right? And that's true for any age. All kids are gonna make mistakes. We as adults, we've been here a lot longer and we make mistakes, but sometimes we go on like, you know, we have it all luck and we have everything properly, but we don't. So, you know, don't, don't try and fake it for you young people because they know we don't always have it under control. An important thing though, is that boundaries can't be too tight because if the boundaries come in too tight and they feel like they're suffocating, they're gonna just step over it. So if you find that you're one of these parents where every single thing you say, no, 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 no. You know, you have a seven-year-old and every time they ask you something, every answer you give, no, 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 you cannot. Then eventually they're just going to stop asking you and they're going to do whatever they want. And you won't know, right? So we have to be reasonable. Say yes, sometimes monitor, guide, correct, and then say no when you really have to say no consequences a big thing children and adolescents must know that there are consequences for every decision they make and every action that they take and we have to follow through with them no the consequences must be appropriate to the infraction so if they were supposed to come home at seven o'clock and they come home at eight o'clock you can't ground them for a month okay you can't take with their phone forever for the rest of the term for three months because they were on the phone for half an hour more no you can take it away, but you have to have limits to how long the consequence is gonna be. And your young people must know how long that is gonna be. And they must know what do they have to do to get back their privilege so that they can work towards it. You know, sometimes parents, as parents, we like to just hold it over the head. Well, you don't have any phone. So mommy, how long is that gonna be? Daddy, how long is that going to be? I don't know, I have to see how it goes. No, we have to be clear. We have to say, well, I want you to be doing Number one, number two, number three thing. And when I see that you can be doing that consistently, at that point, you'll get your phone back, okay? Now, at the same time, you cannot take the phone away if that is the only method you have of being in touch with them and you're one of those parents that have to be in touch with your kids. For example, you have a teenager who you have to call and tell them, okay, walk down the street and I'm gonna pick you up from school then clearly, unless you're gonna go up to school and get them, you cannot take away the phone because it's gonna mess up that plan, okay? All right. Now, what happens when we are parents who provide structure? Structure is a wonderful thing, you know. Sometimes we kid ourselves and we think that young people don't want any sort of structure, foolishness. They like some boundaries. It just can't be too loose and uh, um, it can't be too tight, sorry, right? The boundaries allow them to feel safe because they have a barrier to bounce against 
and test. So their job is to push the limits. Your job is to hold the limit, okay? It also allows them to tolerate a reasonable amount of disappointment. So that's why we don't want those permissive parents who just give everything. Because we need them to realize that, guess what? This life that we're living, it is not all about you. Yes, you're super important, but it's not all about you. So they have to sometimes hear, no, you cannot go to that party. No, you cannot go to that session. And yes, you will survive for that weekend of that session to the next day. It allows them to learn to be responsible. Very importantly, it allows them to learn from their mistakes and that allows them to be independent. And this is how now they learn to internalize those values that you're trying to share with them, okay? So wonderful outcomes if we get it right. Now our other job is that real job, you know, the job that we we'll go to in the morning and we get paid for, and we think that this is a real job. And that's why people who are housewives, other persons who have never been a housewife think that you don't really have a job. Well, let me tell you, I don't want that job because it is way too hard. It is an all day, all night job. I would have gone mad if I had that job. So kudos to the people who have that job. But this job now allows you to show your child. And I think this is possible at any age from about seven, how to budget, you know, what's important. Yes, sometimes we have to do something that maybe is a little frivolous, but that can be a rarity. We have to make sure that we're planning our budget. It allows them to see our work ethic. So if we're gonna be the people that, you know, take a sick leave day to go shopping, but we're not really sick, our kids see that, right? They hear us when we're talking to our friend and saying, yeah, man, you might take off a day, but you know, I had to go to X, Y, and Z. Um, and I never bother put that down. So I just tell them, say, I'm sick. We can't do that, right? And very importantly, that job oftentimes is where we self-actualize. So I think it's very important as adults to feel that we're achieving what we want to do. Now, we always have to consider how does our job affect our child or adolescent? Is it taking us away from them? Is it cutting into all our time? And so we have to figure out a way to carve out that time with our young people. So, you know, things like mommy daughter dates, daddy daughter dates, mommy son dates, daddy son dates. And you treat it like an appointment with the dentist. You know how it's hard to get an appointment with the dentist? So you treat it like that. So if this is what we're doing today, this is what we're doing today. And unless an emergency come up, this is what we're gonna do today so that they feel that you're putting them in that specific and important space. Then now, this new role as surrogate teacher, it's rough, it's very rough, it's very demanding. And guess what the hard part is, is if you leave the house to go for work, you come back tired and then you have to do this. Or worse, if you are working from home during this COVID experience and you have to be juggling your own work, with when they need help or when they can't get online or when they're having a problem with the Google Classroom link or they're having difficulty uploading the homework. Oh my goodness, it's rough. And it's even rougher if you have to now juggle one device between two, three kids or worse, one device between you and two, three kids, it's rough. So I think it is fair to say that all parents currently have a new or renewed very healthy appreciation for what teachers do. I would pause also to say that it's particularly difficult for those parents whose kids have particular challenges of whatever nature, whether they may be hearing impaired, visually impaired, if they may have attention deficit, hyperactivity disorder, ADHD, if they may have autism, any sort of learning disorder or learning challenge is just I don't know, it's like exponentially increased now that we're on this virtual platform. So I feel you. I want you to know that there are many other parents that are feeling the same struggle, but we press on. So really, the first part of all of this is to not to say, yes, you have a whole lot that you're juggling, but guess what? COVID is a major adjustment for everybody. So not just the adults who feel that like they have to juggle all of those roles that we had, the old and the new, but it's for everybody, right? So let's think about what are our young people having to deal with now. 
School is closed. Yes, we have online school, but it's just not the same. You don't have that daily routine. You don't get to connect with your brethren or your sistren, run to joke, lean on your friend and say, yeah, man, or, you know, eat a patty with your friend or sit down and bust to joke. You don't have that. And that's a major, major coping strategy for our young people to just have that routine of getting up, putting on a uniform, getting on a bus, going to school, meeting up with your friends, de-stressing, vital. We spoke about the special education needs. And then we have to remember all these missed opportunities. So, so many of our young people, you know, they missed their graduation at the end of June. They're not sure what's going to happen. The young people who went into first form or they're going into sixth form it's like it's just not the same you know you're going into a major transition and you just don't get to feel that transition you don't get to meet the new people that are there because how do you really meet online when you don't know each other and really get to know them and I think this has been a real learning experience for many young people to recognize that you know what social media is really not superior to the real deal in terms of face-to-face Many are worried about sports scholarships, academic scholarships that may be reduced or not available because of different examination techniques this year. It's a challenge. And then missed relationships. All right, now, let me tell you, we used to think that young people are happy to be at home, but honestly, when they're home and they're stuck with their siblings who are driving them crazy, especially if they're younger siblings, <laughs> And us as parents that are driving them crazy, it's not a pleasant place for them to be. And sometimes we as parents, if we have added stress, you know, like we have job insecurity, we're not sure what's going on with our jobs. Our stress level is going up, 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 up. And sometimes we don't manage our stress very well. And then we take it out on our children, okay? We are all dealing with a fear of the unknown. We don't know when this is gonna end. We don't know when we're going to get the next surge. We don't know when we're going to get the vaccine, if we're going to be able to manage with the vaccine, all of those things. And when we don't have that sense of control where we can kind of figure out what's going on, it is very anxiety provoking. And that is what brings forward the stress, right? Now, we are all moving on and trying to make life continue. But the fact of the matter is, is that there is a consistent level of stress with COVID. And even if we're trying to make it happen and move along, it's still there. So we have to recognize this, that it's still there. What I think sometimes we don't realize as well is that our young people, you know, some of them are at, some are at a point where they're just like, oh my goodness, I'm so tired of this. I'm ready to go out. And they will just go out. Then you have the others who are very concerned, you know, like, Grandma lives here, grandma has hypertension, daddy has hype diabetes. Suppose I go out now when school reopen and I bring that home to them and they can't manage it and they get sick and so forth. So it's really, really rough, okay? Did I say it before? I'm gonna highlight it again. Major adjustment for everybody. So how can you help as a parent? So I think in any problem, the first place to start is what with us. So we have to make sure that we are coping. And there are going to be days where we feel frazzled, we feel overwhelmed, and we're just not holding it together. And I think it is good to be honest with ourselves and with our child and say, listen, babes, I'm struggling today. Today was just a rough day. I feel like I'm trying to run with a million things in my hand, and it's been rough. So I'm really sorry that when you asked me that question, I snapped at you. Just give me a little time, I'm going to go and take a shower and then we can move again. And these are some of the ways that we serve as role models to our young people. And I'm not making it sound like it's easy enough because it is not easy to do that, right? But we have to be able to be the ones that show them that every problem, there's a solution. So we can't just identify the problem and leave it like, whoa, so I identified the problem. How that help anybody? That's the first step. We now have to find a solution. We also have to find silver lining in every crisis, but even in this one. So what are some of the silver linings? Many of us have learned how to use technology better. 
Many of us actually have had opportunities to be able to be home with our children earlier. So you can't stay at work, you can't go to the bar all the time. But guess what? You get to come home and you hang out with your kids. And hopefully you're taking that opportunity to maybe play a Scrabble game, throw two domino, whatever the case may be, right? Um, and we also have to say to them to ask the questions and come up with the answers. We aren't to be the ones that give them all the answers, right? We have to listen to them. Don't ask them a question if you don't want to hear the answer or if you don't have time to listen to the answer. And then when they do decide to come and talk to you, even if it's at 11.30 p.m. when you are ready to sleep, make the time, find a 15 minutes, squeeze it out and say, okay, let me hear it because they may not come back to you. When they tell you their concerns, don't diss them. You know, like, oh, please, that is what bothering you. Don't do that, right? That is not helpful because after you diss them, they're not coming back to come talk to you because you have just made their problem seem silly. And it's certainly not silly for them. So problems are very, you know, they're very me-centered. It's, it's my problem. It's not your problem, but I'm sharing it with you so that I can kind of use this as an opportunity to figure out how I'm going to solve this problem. And your role as a parent is to help them to figure it out. Don't encourage them to hide their emotions. So if they feel nervous, let them look nervous. If they feel sad, let them look sad. So, you know, we have this way when we see our young people sitting down, looking glum. Me dear, why you make up your face so? You don't know how much things you have in life to be happy for and how much things you have to be grateful and how much God has blessed you. These are all true, but they're not particularly helpful statements if your young people are feeling down. Better yet, you say, you know, I noticed you look a little off today. What's up? Anything you want to tell me, share with me, discuss with me? And if they say no, that's okay. You just say, okay, just touch and base. When you're ready to talk, I'm here, okay? That is the most important thing. Always have that door open for them to be able to come and say something to you. What can you do? We are so good at preaching. Please don't preach. Help them to learn how to think. You know, so they make one mistake and then you launch into a preaching fiasco, telling them, don't I didn't tell you last night, don't do this. I told you da -da 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 what's going to happen and see there. How is that helpful? Not helpful, not helpful. You may think it, control those thoughts. Don't blurt them out. You want to say instead, all right. Sounds like based on what you're saying, it didn't work quite the way you wanted it to work. How you think it might have gone if we tried something different? What you think would help in the next time? Yes, in this situation, okay? Try not to tear them down. Focus on their strengths, what they're good at. Everybody is good at something. Everybody is good at something. So you wanna find those things and then boost them. Now, a lot of parents seem to think, you know, the things that they're good at, well, they're supposed to, they're supposed to do that. They're supposed to say, you know, all right, night, night, daddy. They're supposed to take out the garbage. They're supposed to sweep the room. They're supposed to, you know, wash the dishes. Yes, they're supposed to do all those things, but it is nice to say thank you to them when they do it. It's nice to say, boy, you know, you're such a helpful young man. I am so glad I never had to sweep the garage. Not that he didn't plan on sleep, sweeping it, you know, because it's really his chore, but it is a good thing to just pick them up for it, right? People are going to live up to whatever expectations we set for them. So if we say to them, you're good for nothing, Kiso kind of person, or, you know, me no saying about going to anything good in your life, that's exactly what's going to happen. So we have to tell them what we want. I don't want you lying to me because then it's difficult for me to trust you. I want you to tell me the truth all the time. No matter how bad it is, we can work through it. But I must always know that if I ask you a piece of information, what you tell me is how it did go. So I can back you and know where and how to back you, okay? You want them to be persistent in whatever challenge they have, push through the challenges. And we have to set those examples. Show kindness at all times as best as possible. And as Jamaican moms and dads, we are always pushing grades. 
always wanting to them, for them to be on the winning team. Well, guess what? Everybody cannot win. Everybody cannot get an A. But if they do their best, that is always sufficient. So if their best is a C, love it and tell them how proud you are, right? If their best is an A and they get a C, you say, boy, you know, what do you think happened? Why you ended up with the C instead of the A? And you work through that. But it can't just always be a focus on good grades and being the best at the football or the netball. So we spoke about this important now in COVID to find out what's stressful for your young people and then problem solve around it together. Find ways to spend the time together. You know, we spoke about um, playing some dominoes, playing some cards. You can even do chores together. You can, you know, split up the dinner. How you're going to make the dinner together. You can cut each other's hair. You can, you know, style each other hair. All sorts of things. You can just go for a walk. You know, you can turn on a playlist and a tour you dance in the room or whatever, right? Or as a family, that's even better. So important, tell them and show them that you love them. Don't assume they know. I have many young people who are very doubtful as to whether their parents love them. Um, and it's because sometimes we don't tell them. Sometimes, especially as they get older, you know, when they're younger, we hug them and we kiss them and we say, oh, good job, sweetheart. I love you, see? But when they hit like about 11, 12, and I start to get a little facey and sharp mouth, we suddenly, we stop telling them that. We don't hug them anymore. So yeah, you're not going to hug them at school, but you can hug them at home. And that's fine. Help them to look beyond the immediate. So things don't have to happen right now. You don't have to get an A the first time you decide to change your plan of action and you actually say, all right, I'm going to study. So you move from a D to a C, that's okay. We're moving down the line. We're working towards the A, it's going to take time. Things don't happen like that, right? Help them to choose good role models. Discipline, remember, is for teaching. You are not trying to control your young person. What we want them to do is become independent people. So when we're disciplining them, it's not say you want lockdown. You want to teach them to be a better person, right? And we said, model for them. So what are some of the coping styles that we generally use and our young people use? The ones that we don't like is when we're in denial, you know, Psh, there's no problem, I'm good to go. When we disengage, where, you know, that's the parent who's just like, well, I've just had enough of this and I'm not taking it on. It's like your child is absent in the house. And then there's a the self-blame. Oh my gosh, you know, it's because of how things went with me and his father or how things went with me and his mother. That's why she turned out like this. Not helpful. That was then. Let's work on the solution. Or return to smoking or drinking not the way we want us to cope. A little bit more useful now. We want to accept that there's a problem and we're going to plan. We're going to find things to distract us from the things that are particularly challenging. We're going to find positive reframes, you know? So when your daughter or your son face themselves with you, usually it's a daughter, yes, you're going to have consequences for her, but after that, no, rather than only viewing your daughter as, oh my gosh, she is so feisty, the tongue is so sharp, you're going to say, well, you know, she's a firm, very opinionated young person, and nobody's going to take her for granted. That is what we call a positive reframe. Or with COVID, COVID is driving me crazy, but guess what? I learned how to use Zoom. I never know if you use Zoom before, and now I'm a boss, right? All of those sort of things. Planning. How am I going to go through this particular challenge? What am I going to do? Write it out. Have a thought in your head about the plan. Humor. Wonderful way to do it. The boys and the men tend to use this a lot and it's very useful. And then venting. Have a friend that you can call and say, okay, I don't need any advice. I just need to lay something out. I just need to speak it and get it off my system. Okay. What else can we do as parents? We have to just accept social media is a part of their life, especially now that they're not at school. Listen, them have to connect with them some way. 
but we have to monitor. That does not mean you're checking every single WhatsApp message that comes in, but it does mean you monitor the time. They must know that you have the capacity and you should have the password for their phone so you can get in. And yes, when it's 12 o'clock, if it's not a system where you're going to lock off the Wi-Fi in your house, then you're going to say, okay, the phone needs to reach my bed at midnight and we're done. If you want to do it earlier, depending on the age of the child, if you know it's a 10 year old, the phone must reach your bed nine o'clock, no later. Okay. And then we want to not only monitor their social media, but how much exposure they have to bad news or negative pairs. Pairs that, you know, are engaging in stuff that's not safe. So for example, pairs who might be watching porn or might be on gambling websites, all those sort of things, we have to be very careful with those, okay? Try not to take moodiness or frustration of our young people as a personal affront. They are all going through a really rough time and just like you, they have difficulty holding it together sometimes. They are a fraction of your age and my age. So of course, they have less experience with holding it together. So it's not about you when they get frustrated. It's about how they're struggling, okay? Try not to control how they're feeling. You don't have to fix your child. You just have to help them to work at fixing it. So having said all of that, with the struggle, we are certainly seeing an increase in mental health concerns in our young people during this whole COVID experience. We're seeing more depression, more anxiety disorders, more young people are hurting themselves physically. So many of them are making unhealthy choices in terms of smoking or drinking or just getting engaged in very inappropriate sexual activity. Um, and some are using disordered eating to control their emotions and how, you know, when everything else in their life feels like it's out of control, I can control my food. What have we been seeing? What have I been seeing? And therefore what you might be seeing in your young person, sleep disturbances, a change in their appetite, more headaches, whether it be migraine or otherwise, they just constantly feel tired. They have tummy aches a lot. Some of them don't want to leave the house. Some are just a lot more irritable than they used to be. Some not really talking to their friends anymore. Not even on WhatsApp, they're talking to their friends. They're not engaging with the rest of the family. They look sad or any other uncharacteristic behavior. You want to take careful note. So it's a major adjustment. This is like, you know, my thing for all of us. But guess what? I'm now dating myself. You know, the song forward ever, backward never. It's a real thing. So we have to be resilient. And resilience really is achieving positive outcomes despite challenges and threatening circumstances. That means we're coping successfully with traumatic experiences and we're avoiding the negative paths. We, as a people, are resilient people, but it's a process, right? So it's a process where we are going to learn it as we go through it. Now, many of us have learned to be resilient, and so now it's our turn to teach that to our young people. And this is probably one of the hardest experiences they're going to have in their lifetime. So we have to help them roll through it. So I'm going to wrap up now just looking at parental self-care. And I put a quotation that I got from my mom who um, the whole family was going through a lot of difficulties. And I said, you know, mom, I'm working with your daughter, but guess what? You need help. And she looked at me quite simply and she said, Dr. Harrison, I don't have time to be depressed right now. <laughs> and I said, that's really very funny, but at some point it's going to catch up with you. Okay. So we have to look at a balanced plan to our life. So many of us think hard work is the key and the only thing that's important, but I am here to tell you that we have to have that balance. So we have to exercise, we have to eat well, we have to sleep and we have to take time off for ourselves. So the things that you know trigger you and make you get vexed, try and avoid them. Spend quality time with your children. That doesn't mean sitting beside them and watching the TV while you're on your phone and they're on yours. Accept help from others. Do things that calm you, whether it's listening to music, going out in the garden, whatever. Exercise whatever way you can. Talk to your friends. 
schedule some alone time, even if it's 15 minutes when nobody is there to talk to you or call you and then live in the moment. So life is not a matter of milestones and what we can achieve, but of moments. And anytime you feel that you're struggling, get professional help. Thank you so much. I don't know if there are any questions. Thank you very much, Dr. Abigail. That was a really wonderful presentation, a lot of tips, but I know that our parents would be very happy and that probably they have been taking notes like I have because I really learned a lot from your balancing parenting roles and realize that, you know, we're almost like those super moms and probably super dads are, are with us as well. Nurturers, surrogate teachers, um, resilient builders, and of course, we have to take care of ourselves. So I mean, it is a wonderful opportunity for, for you to be with us and for us to learn from you with your wealth of experience and knowledge. I have one question so far. And it's really asking, um, from your experience, are we seeing more children um, with uh, depression and anxiety as a result of COVID-19 and its restrictions? Absolutely. And probably comment on that and give us some tips as well. Yes. So definitely, we've been seeing quite a lot. Um, we have young people who are afraid to leave the home. We have young people who are afraid to join the online class. We have young people who are afraid just to even sometimes go to the supermarket with their parents. Mm -hmm. And so I think we, as parents, we have to work with them to kind of find ways to live this new normal. So mm -hmm. yes, if we're going to the supermarket and we know that our child is anxious, then don't go on a Saturday when it ran. You might want to go at another time where it's a little quieter. You can go and not have everybody beside you. You make sure everybody has on their mask. You keep mm -hmm. your distance from other people. And, you know, we have to let them know that we have to be able to work through this. You know, yeah. we're not going to be able to avoid it. I think another thing we can look at is the peer support as well. Yes. Uh, using the, the, the use of friends, you know. Um, I know some schools have started face-to-face, -face, and so that may alleviate some of those concerns. But for those who have not started face-to-face, -face, I know they have their, their groups, their chat groups, and their, you know, social media groups. So they can use that to communicate as yeah. well as to schedule some activities, even on Zoom whether you have a, a date night or something where you listen to some jokes or some commentaries or so things like that can help in alleviating some of these concerns. Um, there's another question, how can a non-parent help to alleviate some of the challenges faced by their friends who are parents? Oh, wow. So I think that's a great question. Um, that's so fabulous that you would want to help your friend who is a parent. So I think some of the things that can happen is, you know, sometimes you can say, hey, why don't they, you, you know, you take a night off, take a half an hour off, a two hours and leave the kids with me. I will make sure that everybody has on mask. I have on my mask. We do some hand washing. We can play some games. We go outside where there's very good ventilation so that the kids don't have to be close to each other. We can roll a little ball, whatever it is. I think just being there for that parent and mm -hmm. even just sometimes being a listening ear, you know, and saying, oh my gosh, it must be so hard. I know how much I'm struggling with no kids and you have two or three kids. Wow, you're a super parent. And you just, just be there. I think that's the most important thing. And one of the things I would say is that parents have to learn to accept help. Do not be afraid to accept help. You know, sometimes we feel like we have to hold it all together by ourselves, but do not be afraid to accept help from anybody that you trust and you know has your interest genuinely at heart. That's key. I think one of the challenges that some persons have mentioned uh, is about the older parents, grandparents and great grandparents who are actually who have been trusted in this new role and in this new norm, and it becomes a little difficult and overwhelming for them, and especially if they are those who have been asked to stay at home because they may have underlying conditions. And the, the, the challenge for them, how can we mitigate against some of these symptoms that may arise in them? Because 
they have difficulty in understanding online the online platforms they have difficulties in monitoring yes. and, and and not only online platforms some of them may not have the facilities to do that and so they are concerned about their children who children sorry who are at risk for for not being not improving in their academic achievements so what are some of the ways what how can we speak to them how can we encourage them so many challenges you're so right to bring up the grandparents because many of our grandparents play such a significant role for young people you know either keeping them after school back in the day or you know some of them might be better at math than the mom or the dad is and they can help them and so that's really challenging but I think we still need to visit our grandparents sometimes we need to take up the phone and call them you know, even they might, most of them have a cell phone or they have a landline. So even if they're not good with the WhatsApping and the texting, just yeah. do a regular call, which we don't tend to do as much anymore, but we can do a regular call. Um, and I think we should still visit them, but keep your distance. And when you mm -hmm. go there, keep your mask on. Um, if you're, you know, if you're quite distant and you have the space like outside in the garden and you're 10, 12 feet away from each other, you maybe can take off your mask a little bit mm -hmm. so that you know, grandma can see a face, grandpa can see a face because you're far away. Um, and then you put back on your mask now when you're coming nearer, right? So I think it's important for us to stay connected. We can go there, we can pray with them, we can sing two chorus with them, mm -hmm. all of those kind of things. And grandparents love that. They love that. <laughs> I just love any sort of social connection that's there. Yeah, I think this is a very important question that is coming up now. What else can be done to create a paradigm shift in the culture regarding parenting in Jamaica? Ooh, wow, that's a million dollar question. OMG. <laughs> um, so for me, I would say the paradigm shift I would want is for us to move from being complaining parents mm -hmm. to being resilience building parents. I have found when I'm talking to parents and I say, so mom, tell me what your son is good at. They look at me like I'm asking, um, you know, I'm speaking in a different language. And they're like, what do you mean? I said, what are they good at? I don't know. <laughs> we don't focus on the positives, right? <laughs> so sometimes I'll say, well, all right. Does he play a sport? Yeah. Good, so he exercises. Yeah, I said, that's good. Does he sometimes help you to pick up the stuff like carry the groceries in? Yeah, I said, so he's helpful. So then I look at him like, okay. But if I was to ask that same model, what problems do you have with your son? Oh my goodness, like I get a, a sheet. Mm -hmm. So I think that would be the paradigm shift because we spend a lot of time tearing down rather than building. We do it not just with our young people, we do it with the structures in our country. We are complainers. Mm -hmm. And what I would want us to really work together is to build up rather than just complain. So I think if that is the critical paradigm shift that we can have, then we will make amazing differences. There, there's no shortage of potential in our young people. So we just have to see it and move them forward with it. One of the conversations we have been ha having, and they can comment on this, Dr. Harrison, is about um, building that emotional intelligence in our children from um, the early childhood state so that we can enable more them to be more resilient because we know that yes the pandemic is here and there are more crises to come so we want to ensure that we are building their resilience through emotional intelligence but the challenge we have is that the parents are not some are not so emotionally intelligent to help us in in, in creating that education for the children so what I would say is that this younger generation, they're far more aware of their emotions than say my generation was, okay. that's for sure. Um, but I also think a lot of us as adults and as parents, we try to hide our emotions because we, many of us as Jamaicans feel if we show our emotions, it kind of signifies that we're weak, but it's mm -hmm. not. I think it takes strength to show how you're truly feeling. Mm -hmm. 
I'm not saying that, you know, if something bad is happening, you need to break down when you're on the job. But I think if you're in your space with the people that you trust, you don't need to fake it. You can be honest. And I think your home should be that safe space for you and your kids to show their true emotions and support them through that. And, you know, it's, it's not shameful to be feeling sad. It's not shameful to be feeling anxious. It's actually quite normal. And we need to teach them how to work with those emotions. So those emotions aren't hidden and then we can't move forward from it because we haven't worked through it, right? Um, the emotional intelligence, yes, it starts from very early. Just allowing kids to say, to name what they're feeling, you know? I'm angry at what? Because of what? So that they can figure out, well, why did I just push down that little boy? Why was that? Why, why did that happen? And, you know, help them to work through those basic things. So it's, it needs to start really early. Yes, I agree. How do we strike the balance between being safe and allowing kids to, to play? Boy, that's hard. That's really hard. I think it depends on the age. So if you have a older young person that, you know, like a 12 year old or so that, you know, understands what's going on, then I think there is room to have small gatherings, you know, so maybe they can invite one or two friends over, they stay outside, they keep on the mask and they keep their distance. Um, and you make that agreement with your child ahead of time and you occasionally monitor. No, you don't stay out there with them and sit down and in the whole of the conversation for the whole afternoon there together, but just do that. It's very difficult though for the very young ones, so like the three or the four-year-olds because the mask is gonna come off, they're going to be sharing and touching and all of that sort of thing. So you may only be able to have one friend be there and you have to be very conscientious in terms of making sure the masks are on. So that, that can be challenging. Some parents, what they do is they have another family member where they know that we are very careful because we have grandma with hypertension and grandpa with diabetes and we're very careful when we go outside and we wear our masks. And so you might say, okay, this is one friend that I think can come and I can monitor and work together because we're, we are knowledgeable about how to try and reduce the risk. But it is hard, but we have to try and strike that balance. Otherwise, our young people are going to just go stuck, staring nuts because they are so fed up. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, the questions are coming in, Dr. Harrison. I hope you're not getting too tired as yet. Um, my six-year-old cries every day during online classes. It sometimes gets frustrating. How best can I help him? Okay. So um, I don't want anybody in the Ministry of Education to get vexed with me, but... <laughs> He is six years old. So if you sometimes need to give him a break for mm -hmm. an hour, mm -hmm. take him out of class, de-stress with him, do mm -hmm. something fun, go outside and go cut down to a bush, whatever mm -hmm. it is, and then bring him back. He's six. Mm -hmm. Like, come on, what's he going to miss? Nothing Thanks. critical. Mm -hmm. And if you think it's critical, then, you know, you... Later in the afternoon, when he's calm, you just say, okay, remember that thing that the teacher was showing you? And you put up two little things on the fridge or put up a little, little sticker on the wall and you said, this is what it was. That's all, you know, babes. Don't fret about it, but do not stress. Four-year-olds, five-year-olds, seven-year-olds, come on. We have to give them an ease up. We can't stay in a meeting for more than an hour before we're like, when are they going to end? <laughs> so to ask them to do it all day, rough. Yes. <laughs> all right. Okay. Shifting to the youths. How do you help inner city youths to build their self-efficacy during this pandemic? Wow, that's hard. That is very hard. So what I think helps is peer-to-peer -peer support. Mm -hmm. Um good positive adult role models being a part of their lives and recognizing when they do good things. So, you know, if like um, a lady's walking across the street and she has a whole heap of 
stuff in her hand and she needs help and you see a young man go across and help her to carry or a young girl go across and help her to carry the stuff you can comment and say you know that was really lovely I cannot imagine how happy that lady was for that help and just point out how they have contributed and it makes them feel good if they have been able to learn a skill or if you have a system where you know you have a baba who maybe have a little free time on his hands now because guess what not as many people are going to the baba right now then maybe they can set up a little system and teach some of the young men or the young women how to you know cut and that sort of thing that would be good um but i think it can be just small things one at a time. Sometimes, you know, you see somebody in a situation. Um, so let's say they're a security guard, um, but you see them always reading a book or something to pass the time. You say, oh, you like to read. You ever thought of going back to school and doing some more subjects? Mm -hmm. or, you know, you could move up the ladder. You could next be the manager, or the supervisor or whatever. So always giving them something that they can move up so that they don't feel that they have to settle. You never have to settle regardless of where you're from. Mm -hmm. I think once we do that and we're willing to go the extra mile, that will be helpful, but it's hard because sometimes the resources are limited. Yes, yes. Um, how do you help a child who has underlying medical conditions in this pandemic who is very overwhelmed by the news and what is happening to others who have underlying medical conditions and COVID? turn off the news. <laughs> I think we have to limit how much negativity our young people hear. The media is very sensationalistic. So, you know, especially if you listen to US media, it could drive you absolutely into a panic because they have to big up everything that goes wrong and they have to, you know, it's all about selling the news. And if you notice that your young person is getting anxious, just lock off the news lock it off mm -hmm. and minimize how much of CNN they watch, how much they look at, and then kind of say, okay, so yes, you have something that makes it a little bit more challenging, but guess what? We just have to do what we have to do. We have to keep ourselves safe, but we have to find a way to do it that does not prevent us from living our lives because we have to find a balance. Yes. Lock mm -hmm. the news. Okay. I have, I think we're coming down to the final questions. Do you have any tips for dealing with spoiled children? <laughs> <laughs> so, interesting question. So spoiled children um, usually is a result of our own actions. Hmm. So first we have to change our actions. So we have to not always say yes. We can't always say yes. So sometimes I will see parents that say yes, even after the child has thrown a tantrum at age five. And then we say, oh, I can't take it anymore. And we're just giving, no. Because if she knows that all I have to do is throw a tantrum, then they're gonna get it. She said, but doc, I can't bother. I said, so, okay. When he's 18 and you know he is drinking hard, you're going to let him drive the car home when he's drunk? Or when he comes to you tipsy, you're going to give him the key? No. So they have to learn early that sometimes you can't get what you want. And sometimes that's very hard for us as parents because when I tell you them can ball and scream and it tug at your little hard strings and you feel wicked, but guess what? You gotta hold it together. If you know it's not healthy for them or it's not right at this time, then you just say, sweetheart, it's not working for me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I get it. Sorry. And make them cry. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. sometimes if you see that they're really not being able to control themselves, just let them sit in your lap, facing away from you, hold on to them, around them, and just say, okay, I'm going to wait on you to calm down. And we're just going to sit here until you come to a quiet space. And when they do, then you release the hole and you say, okay, that behavior doesn't get you anywhere. When you're ready to talk, you sit here, when you're ready to talk to me respectfully, we can have a conversation. Otherwise, I'm going to go and cook the dinner and you leave. So you cannot engage with them or beg them or plead with them. Please stop the screaming. You're driving me crazy. No. So whenever you decide you're tired of the sport behavior, just say, okay, we've come to a point. 
where we have to make a change. And these are the things that I'm going to change. So look out for it. It's coming. Don't be aggressive, just be firm. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay. What are ways extroverts, students can go about coping with this pandemic while living with strict parents? <laughs> that sounds like a question from a young person. I like that. So I will tell you something I heard Paula and Porter Jones say on the radio one time, which is so true. It's those extroverted children who were always asking questions in class that used to annoy the teacher because they were so bold to ask a question that become leaders, that become mm -hmm. the people who advocate. Mm -hmm. So I think if you're an extrovert, just continue to be an extrovert. Don't expect that your parents are going to always give in, but I think put together a proposal, say to them, okay, I have done so and so and so because you have asked for it. I am now asking for X, Y, and Z. These are the reasons why I think I can manage this situation. And I would like you to give me the opportunity to show you that I can be responsible. Mm -hmm. I might have to say that speech three, four times. I grew up with strict parents. Well, a strict dad. Mm -hmm. But I always knew he loved me. So I knew the rules came from a good place. But I would push. I would push against them on a regular basis. And eventually you get to that point where they're like, okay, maybe she can really manage that. So I, if it is a young person asking it, I say to you, just be persistent, but be respectful. Otherwise mm -hmm. you're gonna lose that battle. That's for sure. <laughs> All right, we're going to take three more questions, Dr. Um, Harrison. Um, how do you place emphasis on seemingly non-essential career paths to the youth in this age of Corona, like aspects of the hotel industry? Oh, oh, you mean non-essential because right now it's not gonna happen. It's yeah. gonna come back. Let me tell you. So if that's their passion, hotel industry must come back because guess what? Everybody love a good holiday. So it's going to come back. We will rise above this. It's just that they're going to be in a little zone where they can't do it right now. But it's yeah. going to come back. So, um, yes, you know, sometimes we have to refashion and repurpose um, and wheel and come again. But I wouldn't say that we're going to give up. On, on some of those areas. Um, mm -hmm. I guess we may have some other outbreak later on, but I think the way science is going now and the way public health is managing, I think we're getting so much better at mm -hmm. dealing with these multiple crises that come along one by one. That mm -hmm. I mean, when have we ever seen a vaccine come out so quickly? So I think don't, don't, turn them away from it, just say, okay, well, you know, if that's where you want to go, just recognize that there are risks with that. Mm -hmm. And so you might want to also develop other skills along with that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right. What's the best approach to disciplining your child being an absentee parent? Wow. So absentee parent and disciplining child, they are not really in the same space. <laughs> um, so I would say if you're an absentee parent, just physically, so let's say you have to be away for work or whatever the case may be, um, then I think you can be an absent physically, but present emotionally and mm -hmm. present virtually. Um, and then I think you still have a role for being um, a disciplinarian in your home or instilling structure. But if you're an absentee parent where, you know, you're not really involved unless there's a big kickoff in the house and then one person call you and say, listen, a man, sort out your picnic. Mm -hmm. You don't have the moral authority to be there. And as your child gets older, they're going to stop listening to you. Um, so it's difficult to balance those two. But if you are present emotionally, um, and when I say emotionally, don't mean you send birthday present and you buy them the tablet and send. I mean, you're present emotionally. So when your daughter gets her first boyfriend, you can talk to your daughter about that sort of thing. When your son come third, you know, 12th in the class and last year he was 20th, you are aware and you big him up for that. That's different. The, in that situation, then yes, you can, you can put um, structure and guidelines in place and hold those things. 
what is the best way for supporting a child who's struggling with parents who have separated? Wow. Um, so a lot of that depends on the parents. So the parents have to be able to be civil with one another. Um, I always urge parents, don't lie to your children. Don't think they don't know. If you and your partner are having problems, trust me, long before you tell your child that there is a problem, them don't know. So, you know, sometimes we treat them with kids' gloves and we want to hide it from them. Waste of time. Be straight up and honest. And I think as children, hopefully our young people have a, a good auntie that they can go and talk to or a good uncle that they can say, oh boy, I'm struggling here. I just need a little space to not hear the argument. Um, and I would say this is a role for where you really should engage with a therapist, a psychologist, you really should get that help just to learn how to work through it step by step with you with your kids but don't pretend like they don't know they know don't kid yourself they're always aware they probably knew before you knew that it was going to end <laughs> okay um we, we're coming down now <laughs> what are some ways a parent could help their child deal with or overcome bullying at school and this could be online as well yeah. Right. So, yeah, we do have online bullying. Bullying is difficult. The first thing is we need to let our young people know that it's not tolerated in any shape or fashion. Now, bullying is not a one off. So, you know, if somebody says one bad thing to you, that's not bullying. Remember, one of the criteria for bullying is that it has to be recurrent. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, our schools, though, play a significant role. They have to have a bullying policy where it's a no tolerance. We're not dealing with that. So if you are caught, you are automatically going to get consequences. And the consequences can't just be, I talk to you. There must be something that is done and done well. I've had lots of young people who have gone to teachers and complained about bullying. And, you know, the teacher says to them, so what do you want me to do about that? What do you mean? What do I want you to do about it? I want you to stop it. I want you to help me to fix this. Mm -hmm. So as a parent, I think you have to advocate for your child. So if there is bullying, find out from your child. OK, how do you want us to handle it? Sometimes they want to try and deal with it on their own. Give them that opportunity. When you see them struggling more or they say to you, OK, I'm not I'm not coping or you see that they're not coping. Go into that school and advocate. Push every button that you have to push to make change happen. Mm -hmm. And don't feel apologetic about it. Don't be apologetic at all. You mm -hmm. are supposed to be your child's best advocate. And if they're not working, you get some other opportunity. You I don't generally suggest moving, but you have to be there and with your young person. And if they're cyberbullying, let the teacher know. Mm -hmm. Oftentimes the teachers don't know. So you have to tell them. And if you feel the teacher not doing anything, go to the grade supervisor. And if the grade supervisor not, go to the principal and you push. You go to the board chair and you push. Don't feel afraid to go to the highest level. All right. Um, this is your last question now. And I want Dr. Leibert to come in on this question as well. And it says on a policy level, what can the government, such as the Ministry of Education, Youth and Culture, and the Ministry of Health and Wellness do to support parents? It seems as if it seems as if we have been abandoned. Oh my, wow, that sounds rough. So I think Dr. Leiber probably is the best person to take yeah, that. Um, I'll turn it over to her. <laughs> Okay, she's, she's, she's with us. Yes. Um, could you repeat the question, Dr. Crossman? On a policy level, what can the government, such as um, Ministry of Education and Youth and Culture, and the Ministry of Health and Wellness do to support parents? It seems as if we have been abandoned. Okay, well, first of all, I don't think parents have been abandoned. There's National Parenting Support Commission. Now I know that they had a kind of um, halting start, but um, I was recently at a function with the person who has taken over, and I think they have a good program in place. So I await that when that program is rolled out, more parents 
will um, feel the effect. I know they had a principle of really trying to root the parenting program in communities where you'd have like parent mentors, older parents mentoring, um, you know, younger parents um, and having what they call parenting places. Because of course you can't stay at the Ministry of Education and reach every parent. So I thought it was a good principle, but um, there, there was a problem with the execution. So I am looking forward to, you know, that coming to fruition. Um, during the COVID time, and I think it's still up, they had um, parenting support hotlines, you know. Mm -hmm. I don't know if everybody was aware of this. I think it was per, per parish. Okay. Uh, so that was available for parents also to call. Okay. Um, in terms of the Ministry of Health, you see, we have really um, said, I guess a division of labor. Parenting, we have, we have kind of said belongs to, let's say, Ministry of Education, especially with the early childhood um, emphasis three to eight, right? However, we, there are some aspects that we do get involved in. Um, I know we do parenting, like we are doing a parenting seminar now, um, but we are also looking at, let's say, zero to three before they go into maybe an early childhood institution. And um, there is a program called Reach Up Jamaica, where particularly at risk mothers, maybe a teenage mother does not much support. You train the community health aides to go in and teach the children, teach them how to parent and stimulate the children. So um, that is where we, well, that is one focus. And through our child and adolescent mental health clinics, we also try, I know, try to do parenting, but that is kind of after the problem has occurred, right? Mm -hmm. um, but you still need that help after the problem has occurred. And um, as I was saying, the emotional intelligence, we really had thought, well, if it is properly instituted, but again, we have to teach parents emotional intelligence because they weren't taught either. So we, the program of in, emotional intelligence, again, was a kind of protective way for our parents to be able for them to manage their emotions and to teach it to the children. So that was a mouthful, thank you. <laughs> I think also Dr. Libo, that we need to mention that there's a mental health helpline, one oh, yes. eight. N-E-W-L-I-F-E-188 -E -E, New Life. And I believe that you can access that helpline as well so that we can get help not only for the parents but also for the children. Given that we are not in schools and the teacher may not be able to identify online the challenges that children may be having. And so to refer them to the child and adolescent mental health services across the island. So the mental health helpline, I believe, is also very important, 188-N-E-W-L-I-F-E. -E. So that's another um, way that we can focus. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. parents. Preston, sorry, yeah. sorry, before you finish, since yes. you reminded me of that, we should also tell them that we are uh, venturing in the arena of tele mental health and yes. that our practitioners throughout the child guidance clinics island-wide have telephones with plans on them so that we can reach out more to our parents and clients if they can't actually come to the clinic. Thank you. Right. So that's if they access our clinics, then we are able to speak with them and to find out a little bit more. And then sometimes we have, we can, we try to schedule face-to-face -face if that becomes necessary, given the circumstances that we are operating in at this point in time. So if you call the helpline or even reach out to your teachers who can reach out to the child and adolescent mental health services, then we are able to assist. 
All right. Thank, Thank you, everybody. Let me, on behalf of the Department of Sociology, Psychology, and Social Work at the Western um, Jamaica campus of the University of the West Indies, the Child and Adolescent Mental Health Services at the Western Regional Health Authority, and the Child and Adolescent Mental Health Unit at the Ministry of Health and Wellness. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. We especially want to thank our persons who provided greetings, Dr. Patrick Prendergast and Dr. Judith Leibel. And we especially want to thank wholeheartedly Dr. Abigail Harrison for so ably directing us and answering such a barrage of questions directed at her so ably. We really want to thank you. We have a lot of food to look to feed on, and we hope that this will enable our parents to be more informed, to be more effective, to be more resilient, and to be able to take care of themselves. Before we go, we would like to inform you that we are here for two more days. Tomorrow, Wednesday, we have Dr. Alfred Dawes, who is going to be speaking on securing a place for the Jamaican father during a global pandemic. And Mrs. Natalie Gray Reed, an attorney at law, speaking on the rights of the Jamaican father. And we end on Thursday. We start at 7 p.m. Each, each evening, where we will have a panel discussion looking at holding ourselves during a global pandemic strategies for self-care and parenting. We look forward to seeing you on our two other two days, Wednesday and Thursday. We start at 7 p.m. Please register online and make sure that you're a part, your voice is heard, participate in the discussions, and we know that we will enable to ensure that our parents are not only prepared for this crisis, but any crisis that will come in their surroundings or in their lives. Thank you very much, everyone, for joining us, and we look forward to seeing you tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you, sir.